Hey there, everyone. Welcome back to Utility Sports. And in today's video, we're going to be covering the New Orleans Pelicans with an off-season preview. And this is actually one of the most requested videos on the channel right now, which I think is really, really awesome to see. To be honest, New Orleans to me had always seemed like a football city where the Saints kind of dominated the market there. And the Pelicans were almost an afterthought, it seemed like, especially to me, someone who does not live in New Orleans. That's at least how it seemed on the outside. But with the amount of requests I've had for a Pelicans offseason preview, I feel like that's changing. And that's really, really awesome to see. And I love that for the city of New Orleans, for Pelicans fans in general, and for this entire organization. So that's a testament to you guys, the fans here that are requesting this video on the channel. Because I do think that the amount of interest in Pelicans basketball has really skyrocketed, specifically within the past 12 months. And we're going to talk about all of the moves that led up to this and, and why this team is such a fun team to cheer for now moving into the future. Pelicans fans, if you are new to the channel, please leave a like on today's video if you do enjoy. I put a lot of time and effort into these videos and then also subscribe as well if you'd like to see more of my future NBA content. And also if you're just a fan of the NBA in general and not necessarily a Pelicans fan, I think this will still be a great channel for you. I have a ton of other teams offseason previews on the channel. And we're also going to be covering stuff like the NBA draft consistently uh, and a whole bunch of other fun videos on the channel. So make sure to stay tuned for that. And now without further ado, Pelicans fans, let's go ahead and jump into the video here. And we start with the video preview like we do in every single one of these offseason previews. So I think it's important to keep the same type of outline moving forward. And here we're going to start with the 2021-2022 season, talk about the record and a variety of bright spots for this Pelicans team. Then we're going to go into some key decisions to make for their decision making going into the future. Of course, the Pelicans did make it into the plane this past year, but I'm sure that they want to even get further than that down the road, which means there might be some decisions that this team has to make. Then we're going to look at the 2022 NBA draft. There's one really big fun part about the draft this year for the Pelicans, and a lot of the Pelicans fans know exactly what it is already, but we're going to cover it in depth in this video. We're gonna talk about potential draft targets as well. We'll look at NBA free agency, see what the Pelicans could do there. We'll talk about their cap space and, and potential targets that they could look at for this off season. And then also looking into next season, because of course there is a lot of excitement and buzz right now for the Pelicans going into next year. And this off season, you know, it's always fun to talk about the off season, but the off season is important because of its impact on the actual season next year i think there's a lot of different things that they can do to really advance where this team is at currently so let's go ahead and talk about that 2021 2022 season they finished with a 36 and 46 record so not the most attractive record not the best record uh, by any stretch you know 10 games below 500 not phenomenal but they did make the play in with a win over the san antonio spurs they were outright the ninth seed in the western conference of course, the Lakers collapse near the end definitely helped that as well, which is awesome to see. And then the Clippers as well. They beat the Clippers, got a little bit of help from the basketball gods per se with the Paul George COVID test. But even if Paul George played, there's a good chance that the Pelicans still could have won that game. And that's the beauty of the play is it is just one game. You need to win one game to get in. Once they beat the Spurs, they had one game ahead of them and they got in which was awesome. Of course, they had a really competitive series as well with the Phoenix Suns, actually pushed them to six games, which I don't think anyone was expecting before the series started. Phoenix, of course, really, really good. Again, New Orleans got a little bit of help with Devin Booker missing some time in that series. But even with Devin Booker out, you know, they gave Chris Paul fits and not a lot of teams do that. So a real testament to this team there in New Orleans. So let's talk about the bright spots. I think the first one here is the, the one that we should talk about, CJ McCollum. You know, they made a really risky trade for him, giving up a, a pick that was protected five through 14 or non-protected five through 14, excuse me, uh, when they were a team that looked like they were destined for the lottery. Uh, and in turn, they brought in CJ McCollum from Portland. They went 13 and 13 with him, which doesn't look like a great record, but they did end the year with two back-to-back -back losses once their seating didn't really matter as much anymore. And also, you know, when you bring in a new player, you're going to have some of those chemistry issues. Look at what's happened in Sacramento when they brought in Sabonis, who's a very good player in his own right. The Kings struggled. Uh, and I think CJ McCollum and the Pelicans actually didn't struggle that much despite a 500 record. Uh, and at the time they brought him in, you know, they were 23 and 33. So they, they took a big risk and a big swing here, making a move like they did. 
Uh, and it did pay off because they got into the playoffs. They won two games against Phoenix. And that that is awesome to see for a team like New Orleans. The NBA wants these smaller market teams to be good, competitive, and successful. And I think the Pelicans uh, are in a position where they're doing all of those things and more. Then we look at Brandon Ingram, and it's just really solidified where he's at. You know, the season, he had the season we all expected. But I think the biggest thing is his first ever playoffs. He showed out. And I think that's what everyone wanted to see. Everyone wanted to see when the going gets tough, you get him in a playoff series. How is Brandon Ingram going to do? And he performed at the highest level. So that's a huge testament to Brandon Ingram. They do not win two games against the Suns if Brandon Ingram isn't a part of this team. He is really one of the best underrated players in the league. Uh, And I think he doesn't get enough uh, credit because he's playing in New Orleans, but he's such an awesome, good young player. Now, everyone looks at Zion Williamson as the future of this Pelicans team, and I understand why. But Brandon Ingram should be right there in that conversation with Zion because of his impact, his performance specifically this past postseason. And then the trio of rooks. I think this is really the trio that got everyone back into basketball there for the New Orleans Pelicans. I would attribute these three with generating a lot of buzz and really keeping basketball exciting for the New Orleans Pelicans. When you look at a player like Herb Jones, and I think he's really the heart and soul there at this point. Uh, for what New Orleans, uh, New Orleans basketball, excuse me, is supposed to look like one of the defense best defensive rookies ever. He was phenomenal defensively as a rookie. And I actually had written an excerpt about him before last year's draft saying that I thought he was going to be a player that could help a contender immediately. I had him in my top 30 on my big board, whereas everyone else looked at him as a, a second round pick. David Griffin drafted him, you know, 35th or 36th overall, I believe. And he was so great this year, his combination of length, IQ, footwork, and understanding of basketball makes him such a good competitive defender. And he's also really improved offensively. He can knock down open jump shots more consistently than he could last year at Alabama. And he's someone who I just think is going to continue to get better and better and better and be a real key contributor for this Pelicans team, specifically around Zion Williamson, Brandon Ingram, and CJ McCollum. You need defensive players like that. And then they also found another one undrafted, and that is, of course, Jose Alvarado, uh, or as everyone in New Orleans likes to call him, Grand Theft Alvarado. Really, really great find again by this front office there in New Orleans. I don't think he's going to be, you know, a guy who really is a franchise changer, but in some ways he already has for New Orleans in terms of the excitement, the buzz around this team, like I keep talking about. And I do think that's really important. New Orleans, that's the loudest I've heard the Smoothie King Center ever, I think, uh, was this past year, just when Alvarado would get a big steal or Herb Jones would block a three-point shot. I mean, it was just awesome hearing New Orleans in that arena so loud this season, specifically toward the end. And once they got to the playoffs, it was just a really, really great environment to watch basketball from. And then we haven't even talked about Trey Murphy yet, who was their first round pick last year. And I think was a really, really good find as well out of Virginia. I know, you know, I talked about Herb and Alvarado before him, but I think Trey Murphy's the guy who maybe has the highest ceiling out of all three. And if he continues to get better and better and better, you're looking at a great constitution of players around your big three of Zion Ingram and CJ McCollum. You have the players in the depth around them to make noise in the postseason. We saw that already this year. Then you add Zion Williamson back into the fold, and it's going to be really, really scary to face the New Orleans Pelicans down the road. Then I also want to shout out Willie Green, a very smart coach, former NBA player, spent time with Phoenix as an assistant. And now at this point, uh, I think you can confidently say New Orleans has found their head coach of the future. That's been an issue for the New Orleans Pelicans. You know, with Zion Williamson, he's already had three head coaches. They found the guy, though. Willie Green, you know, everyone's going to talk about his uh, end of season. Hey, we got to fight right now. We got to fight for our lives. His big speech that he made in the plan. And credit to him for that. That was an awesome moment for this Pelicans team. But really, all season long, he had been making huge strides for this organization in terms of X's and O's and decision making. And obviously the big hoorah speech and spiel is what's going to draw a lot of attention, but really all the other underlying decisions and IQ and the sets that they run. Willie Green is a very good coach. I can already tell. And I think the Pelicans found their guy for that position. And the biggest thing here, and I feel really sorry for Pelicans fans about this. They have proof for Zion and I'm going to bash on the mainstream media here a little bit specifically the big 
national media covers like ESPN and Slam and all of them. It's been ridiculous hearing about Zion Williamson potentially picking up his qualifying offer and not happy in New Orleans. This started after his rookie season. That has never, ever, ever been the case before where we talk about a player after year one of their career potentially leaving. And that is insane. And I'm sorry to Pelicans fans that you've had to deal with that. And I know it gets annoying. And I'm sorry about that, that you have to listen to that because Zion Williamson isn't going anywhere. He is not. He wants to stay in New Orleans. He said it himself. And I think he's going to sign that max extension with New Orleans. There's probably going to be some stuff in there as well about injuries. If he misses this many games, you know, his pay gets reduced, whatever it is. But ultimately, the Pelicans are in a position here where they prove to Zion, hey, we want you. We're going to keep you. And you want to be here because this team is good with or without you. Imagine with you in here how good we could really be. And I think for New Orleans, that's an awesome story. And it's the perfect way for this to end up coming to fruition. And then we look at some key decisions to make here for the Pelicans. First of all, Kyra Lewis Jr. has a team option. I don't really have a feel for what they're going to do about this. He just hasn't worked that well in the NBA. Uh, I think they're going to keep him, but I wouldn't be fully shocked if they actually declined his team option. It's not very often that you do see that. Uh, you know, a player like Jalen Smith, uh, his team option was actually declined by the Phoenix Suns. Now, I'm not saying Ky Kyra Lewis is for sure going to get declined, but I wouldn't be shocked if the Pelicans don't hold on to him. And then we also want to look at potential roster reshaping. Jonas Valanciunas, who's a good player. I, I just think throughout the playoffs, when you get deeper into the postseason, at some point Valanciunas becomes a little less playable. We saw that with the Raptors when they moved him for Marc Gasol. Uh, and I think with the Grizzlies, you know, moving on from him, they kind of had the same understanding as well that they wanted to build their team slightly differently. So I'm interested to see if New Orleans ever really enters that situation. I don't think it'll be this offseason, but I think probably starting next offseason is when they would start considering a Valanchunas trade. And then Devontae Graham, uh, who they gave up their first round pick this year for in a sign-in trade from the Charlotte Hornets. They were really high on this kid. I understand why. He shoots a ton of three-pointers, shoots with a lot of range. His efficiency is not the best, uh, partially because he shoots so many threes. You know, his field goal percentage is going to be naturally low. And he's someone who I think, based on what we saw from him a few years ago, you could have said, oh, this kid's a growing playmaker, uh, a pretty solid shooter from the perimeter. But I, I just think there are some, some serious flaws in his game as well. So I think that potentially David Griffin could already look at flipping Devontae Graham. I'm not certain that it's going to happen, but I wouldn't rule it out either. Then we move into the daring David Griffin. And I want to talk about David Griffin a little bit here because he is one of the biggest risk takers in the NBA, it's going to be difficult to find a GM or executive who makes more moves and more decisions throughout the trade market and who is more active on the trade market than David Griffin. He's a very active GM. We saw that back when he was in Cleveland, and he's been very active for the Pelicans as well. You know, he was a big risk taker this year. I talked about it already with the CJ McCollum trade, but at the time they traded for him, I thought they were a little crazy because I thought they were essentially giving away a lottery pick to the Portland Trailblazers. And it ended up paying off. You know, they got into the playoffs. The pick was already going to go to Charlotte. They essentially traded that pick two or three times. Uh, and that's a really, really great way to maximize value is if you send out a pick with protections, you can send out new protections on the pick to other teams. And with where they were at, you know, I understood why Portland viewed it as a good trade for them. Now they are sending their 2025 first out to Portland instead uh as the uh, backup protection on that behind the the pick they traded this year so it's not like they gave up nothing for cj but it is a much better looking trade now the fact that they did make the playoffs that pick was already headed to charlotte anyway so david griffin deserves a lot of credit and he was on the hot seat he made a ton of big decisions and really if he wasn't on the hot seat i don't think there would have been a trade for cj but i think they wanted to push for the playoffs and he ultimately did save his job this offseason so a big credit to him I was getting ready to write the eulogy for his time in New Orleans, but it looks like he's going to be staying there at least for another year or two, I would have to think, just given how the season played out and how they ended the year on a very high note. Then let's look at the NBA draft, and I think this is the, the part that the Pelicans fans are most excited for, and I understand why. Look at the draft assets here, and this goes to show how important the Anthony Davis trade was for resetting the table here in New Orleans. They have the 2022 Lakers first round pick. It is top 10 protected. 
if it goes to um, 11, uh, because he did trade, David Griffin traded this to Memphis as well. So he traded 11 through 30 to Memphis, and there's a 7% chance that it actually does not convey to New Orleans and ends up at pick 11 or lower, which again, it's not very likely, but 7% chance it happens. So potentially the Pelicans could not have this pick if the lottery does not treat them well. But then they also have their own second round pick and they have the Utah Jazz second rounder. So they have two second rounders to play with. And more than likely, a 93% chance here that they will have that Lakers first in the top 10, which is a really awesome asset to play with. So with that asset, what are the things that they could consider? They could look at a point guard. They could look at some shooting from the perimeter. They could use a rotational big behind Valanchunas for the short term. I know they also have Jackson Hayes there, who uh, has been a really nice fit this past year specifically. I think took a big step forward. But again, I still think they could use one more big in the picture. Or they could just go best player available or player that they view has the highest upside. And maybe they use that player as a trade ship or they just try and develop him and add him into an already really great core of players. So with the draft targets here, there's about a 26% chance that the Pelicans could move into the top four, which if that happens, NBA watch out because the addition of either a Chet Holmgren, Jabari Smith, Jay Nivey, or Paolo Boncaro to this already really great team. Oh my goodness. Watch out because I think any of those four players could really make the Pelicans a scary contender within the next couple seasons. But otherwise, let's assume they stay right around that pick number eight spot, which is right where their odds are about. You could look at a forward or guard in Benedict Matherin, who is very talented with the ball in his hands, uh, very athletic and hit the hit the lane hard in stride and, and flush it home on someone, but also has pretty good shooting touch from the perimeter. Very comfortable shooting the ball from 25 to 27 feet. Uh, so he's going to really be accustomed to the NBA three point line on day one of his NBA career. And I think uh, adding a player like him, who also has pretty good defensive upside, gives you a player who you can also throw at uh, other guards. You know, you look at Herb Jones, who's a, a freak versatile defender. You look at Jose Alvarado, who's going to be very good on point guards. And then you add another player who can guard wings and guards in Matherin. It's a good combination. Otherwise, if you want to go high upside here, you can look at a player like Shaden Sharp, who has not played a college game in his career, uh, but is very young very athletic and is one of the players that if you want to take a risk on he could end up being one of the best players from this class easily so i, I like that option for them if you want to go with the rotational big you look at a guy like jalen duran who's going to be one of the most switchable players in this class probably one of the best centers in this class i think him and chad holmgren are one two uh, and then with duran here the one thing i really love about him uh, is he reminds me of a young bam out of bio where he's switchable all this raw athleticism great coordination in the air very good hand-eye coordination, specifically catching lobs. Uh, and is just in a really, really good position most of the time. And even when he's out of position, is athletic enough to make up for it. So Jalen Duran is a player I'm very high on. I think if the Pelicans could grab him, that would be a scary grab for the Pels. Then uh, I have two fun ones here. And this is going to be ones that maybe surprise Pelicans fans, but they're really fun for me to talk about. And that's forward AJ Griffin or forward Jeremy Sohan. And I know you're going to say, oh, we have Trey Murphy and Herb Jones and Brandon Ingram, Zion Williamson. We don't need these type of forwards. And I agree, you don't need them. But in my head, I just think about a small death type lineup where you're playing uh, on your roster. You maybe are playing CJ McCollum at point guard. You got like Brandon Ingram, Herb Jones, Trey Murphy, Zion Williamson. And then you throw in an AJ Griffin or Jeremy Sohan. You could have four or five, six foot six to six foot nine players who are talented, skilled, good defenders with a ton of athleticism, speed on the floor. You could play a lot of centers out of the playoffs with this type of lineup where you stretch them out, play five out type of offense, attack closeouts well, and just slash through defenses. And I think you know, AJ Griffin is talented enough defensively with really good offensive skill set that it could work. Whereas Jeremy Sohan, you put him next to Herb Jones and Jose Alvarado, nobody is scoring on you. Sohan, probably one of the most versatile defenders in this class as well. I talked about it with Duran. Sohan at times for Baylor would guard fives, sometimes would guard ones, sometimes would guard threes. He guarded literally everything and he was great at pretty much all of it. So uh, out of Baylor, I think Sohan's an intriguing grab as well. And it would just be a lot of fun to watch all these forwards and lengths uh, and wings with length just flying around the, the, the floor. It would kind of remind me of what Toronto is doing, but I think there's more high end offensive upside here in New Orleans, just with the fact that you have Ingram and also Zion Williamson. Then we move into NBA free agency. And 
The Pelicans, uh, with where they're currently at in terms of cap space, they are over the cap. So they don't have uh, a real way here to bring in players through cap space. But what they do have is the non-tax pyramid level exception available to them, which is up to around $10.5 million in an annual total for one or more players. So say you could sign two players at $5 million each and fit them into that, or you could sign one player at $10 million, essentially, and bring him in uh, as a mid-level exception. I don't think the Pelicans will use the full mid-level, and that's the nice thing here, is you don't have to use all of it. You can use a speci specific percentage of it as well, and I think the Pelicans would use, at the very most, probably around seven to seven and a half million dollars, and the reason why is they're about $7.8 million away currently from the luxury tax, which, for those wondering why this is important, and why would you not use just 7.8 then and get right up next to it? Because some players have bonuses in their contract, like CJ McCollum, and some of them are deemed as likely, which means they already count into your cap space. And that might be, you know, games played or points or, you know, making the play in stuff like that. But there are also some in there that are considered unlikely bonuses, which could be like, again, games played. It could be Oh, if, C if CJ McCollum, this is just an example. This is not an actual one. But if CJ McCollum were to play all 82 games, he would get a $500,000 bonus. And I don't know if that's, I don't think that's an actual one, but it could be something like that. And that would be considered unlikely because it's not likely he plays all 82 games. But if he did, uh, and an unlikely one that's not counted into the cap space, all of a sudden you have to use it, you would go over the luxury tax. So I think that they would save themselves some room here looking at their unlikely bonuses to uh, give a little bit of wiggle room uh, in terms of a few hundred thousand dollars in order to avoid entering the luxury tax just because it does have serious ramifications specifically for smaller market teams because uh, again they just don't have as much money from their owner to pay typically. So some free agent targets I could see them using their mid-level exception on is an unrestricted free agent in Gary Payton II from Golden State. Uh, and for me with the Pelicans again I'm looking for another guard who can defend multiple positions uh, and I think would be a really fun addition into this team. Could you imagine Alvarado and, and the Mitten flying around together? Oh my gosh. And the biggest thing with Gary Payton II is he's really improved offensively. He really knows how to operate in that Bruce Brown type of role where he can screen as a guard. But he's also specifically improved as a corner shooter. I believe he shot around 40% from three from the corner this year, which is good enough to keep a defense honest. And if they're not honest, he can knock it down. So I think he'd be a good fit next to their other players. Otherwise, I'm looking at a few restricted free agents in here. A player like Amir Coffey from the Clippers, who has really immensely improved as a three-point shooter in his time in the league. Coming from the Minnesota Golden Gophers, he did not shoot the three ball at all. And toward the end of the season, you know, he had that one big performance. But I've been tracking his career for quite some time when he was playing with the Agua Caliente Clippers. Uh, and just with the Clippers a few, over the past few years, Coffey has really greatly improved as a shooter. He's a smooth guard who's a little bit bigger at about six foot seven. And again, a pretty solid defender. So you bring him into New Orleans, and I think he could fill out, you know, your eighth or ninth man type of role. Traveling Queen was actually the G League MVP for the Rio Grande Valley Vipers. Uh, and it's not very often you see a player like him get in uh, a deal that's a non-taxpayer mid-level exception. But this is an example here where I could see them splitting, you know, Amir Coffee and Traveling Queen into maybe two contracts here worth about $7 million in total. And then also Dante DiVincenzo, who did not have a great year, pretty solid defensively, shot you know sub 40% from the field though. And, and maybe they give him a one year, $7 million deal. It's kind of like a prove it. And we'll see what he can do for us next season for New Orleans. But I think that these are some intriguing options. These are options that are kind of non-orthodox. Not a lot of people are talking about these players, but I do think all four of these players have decent futures in the NBA and can find certain ways to help impact winning in New Orleans, which I think is all it's about right now, is try and find one or two more players that can help you win maybe one or two more games in the regular season. And that's going to go a long way in helping your playoff seating moving forward. And then next season, the goal is to be a playoff team outright. And what I mean by that is to be a top six seed in the Western Conference. That's going to be really tough to do. You know, when you look at the teams like Golden State and Phoenix, and you also have Memphis in there and the Minnesota Timberwolves have been better. The Dallas Mavericks aren't going anywhere. The Denver Nuggets are getting healthy. They're six already. The Clippers are awesome. It's going to be tough. It's very tough to be a top six team in the West. So the realistic outcome is you make it back into the play-in and you hope to make the playoffs from there. The one thing that New Orleans has that other teams don't is a returning Zion Williamson. And I know it's really easy to look at yourselves and say, oh, we won 36 games without him. We could probably win 45 with him. 
I understand that train of thinking. I do, but it's not just that easy. You add a player back in, you have to deal with the chemistry of that. You have to make sure Zion's in shape. It's going to be his first time playing a game in 18 months when he comes back. So, you know, you're going to have to deal with some rust. You're going to have to deal with some fit. How does he play with CJ McCollum? We've never seen the two of them on the floor together. There's going to be some of these things, which you call learning curves, where they have to spend some time playing together, figuring out this new team. Willie Green has never coached Zion Williamson in a game. That's what we're talking about here when it comes to really trying to figure out what this identity of the team is. Because you have to reintroduce Zion with Brandon Ingram. You have to introduce him to playing alongside CJ. You know, he's also never played with Herb Jones or Trey Murphy. So you're going to have a lot of your role players having never played with your best player. It's interesting. We'll see if the Pelicans can make it work. I'd hope to see them just be an outright playoff team. It would be awesome. And you also have that top pick. Maybe they have enough on this roster to really move the needle and become an outright playoff team. I think they're ready for a jump. We'll just see if they can get it done or not next season because it is very difficult to do. But again, hopefully you guys did enjoy today's video. Pelicans fans, thank you so much for watching. I really do appreciate you spending time to watch this video. Hopefully you feel like I covered your Pelicans fairly well. Uh, and of course, if you do believe that, please hit that subscribe button for more NBA coverage. We have a bunch of other NBA offseason previews on the channel. We also have a lottery odds video on the channel that I think is really good and some really fun NBA mock drafts as well. Thanks again so much for watching, guys. Hopefully you enjoyed. And until next time, we'll catch you in the very next Utility Sports video.